Well, good morning. Excellent. Hey, no, uh, thanks for coming today. You know, we purposely don't announce to you guys who's speaking the next week because you never know if you would actually come if you knew. For example, last night during this little meet and greet time, I'm halfway up and I'm, I got my notes in hand and I'm, I'm ready. I'm inspired. And this gentleman stops me and he's like, you know, he greets me and he sees the mic and he's like, oh, are you teaching tonight? <laughs> I'm like, well, yes. He's like, oh, we thought Tyler was teaching again. <laughs> so, yeah, so you're stuck with me this morning. And, you know, I want to share with you before we get going that out of every sermon I've prepared, and, and I can probably say this every time I prepare a sermon, this is one that I think God is chiseling away at me on. Uh, and as I've prepared this and, and wrote up my notes and, and prayed through this the last month or so, I'm so far from having conquered what I'm going to talk about. It's, it's an ongoing struggle for me as well. And so I want you to know that as we go into this, and hopefully you can glean a little bit from the, what God's been, you know, like I said, chiseling away on my heart. So if you want him to teach you this morning, if you want to hear from God this morning, then I encourage you to take the next couple moments in prayer and ask him to teach you. God, I thank you so much that, um, that you would use guys like me and uh, that you give us the privilege of sharing your word. Lord, I pray that right now you would block out any distractions, anything that would keep us from hearing from you. I pray that you would work on our hearts and our minds that that what we hear would, would fall deep into the soil of our heart and that we'd know how to apply it to our lives. God, push me aside and speak this morning. Amen. All right, so I'm curious, how many of you have ever been skydiving? A few. Now, first of all, I have to confess, anytime I talk about my extreme sports, it's really me just living in the past because these were all before married life. All right, ever since married life, it's been maybe someday when the kids are in college, you can do that again. All right, so I have to reminisce and live in the past, and I've been skydiving a few times. I absolutely loved it, and one of the things that I loved about skydiving is there's no way to be half in. There's no halves about it, and I remember sitting there on the side of the plane, a fully functional plane, and why in the world I was about to jump out of this thing, I have no idea. And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking, and it's, there's like horizontal rain. I was about to go in the Navy, and so I wanted to go. It's like, hey, if I'm giving my life away, I might as well jump out of a plane. And so I was about to leave, and so I'm sitting in this plane, and the rain's hitting me on the face, and my cheek's all flapping. And you should see the video someday. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, what am I about to do? And right about then, as I'm like looking back at the seat right here, now I was going tandem, so the, the dive master's on my back here. And I'm looking at this seat and going, that looks nice. And right about then, foo! Here we go. I have no idea when he pulled the, the chute because I didn't pull it. And I was screaming and, and, you know, afterward, look on the video. I told people I was screaming for joy. I was screaming for my life. It was, it was the coolest thing. And there's this moment of, of intense fear and adrenaline. And then suddenly when the chute pulls, everything gets peaceful. And it's probably the most surreal experience I've ever had in my life. And... I liked it because, again, like I said, if you have the option of being half in, if I have the option of being half in on something, I'll probably take the half in option. All right? I like to be a little bit more conservative, even though I tell you these stories, than, than just jumping out of a plane. Take, for example, last Tuesday, a buddy of mine was having bike night. All these bikers get together and they work on their bikes. And, and my buddy decides, or we've discussed ahead of time, he's going to teach me to ride a motorcycle. And... I, the last time I was on a motorcycle, I was 19, and I drove it about three feet and dumped it before I went in the ditch, and I had already bought it, and so then I sold it a little while later and made some money. So me and motorcycles haven't gotten along so, so far. Now, so he, the plan on bike night is to teach Dwayne to ride a motorcycle. If you were to come up to me and ask me, Dwayne, did you get on a bike? I sure did. Now, if you were to say, Dwayne, did you ride a motorcycle? No, no, I didn't. Because when I got there, he wanted to put me on this bike that's like this tall. And I'm sitting here looking at this bike, and I'm like, dude, I have to jump to get onto this motorcycle. If I can't touch the ground, I'm not going to get on it. And he's like, well, if you're not willing to, to go all in, I, I guess you could ride my five-year-old son's bike. I've, I've welded on training wheels. I actually went over and sat down on that bike. Okay? And I'm like, this is more my size. And he refused to fire it up for me. You see... I think for, for so many of us, especially me, if there's 
a way to play it safe. If there's a way to go halfway and then check things out a little bit, that we're inclined to do that for the sake of self-preservation. Now, we've been talking about kingdom parables, and the parable we're going to talk about this morning, these were guys who were all in. They didn't do anything halfway. So let's turn there. We're in Matthew chapter 13, starting at verse, well, let me make sure I tell you the right verse, 44. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, don't get distracted by the, the first section. Some people think, well, isn't that unethical? Hey, if one of my workers in my field found a treasure, they should be reporting it to me. Well, rabbinic law of that time, just so you know, it was the old rule of finders keepers. If you find a treasure, you get to keep it. So this man is actually doing a noble thing by purchasing the land. So he's honoring the landowner when he could have just laid claim. So that way they both benefit. But this treasure was of, of such great value that he went and sold everything he had to attain to it. He was all in. And the same with this merchant who finds a pearl. Now, it's very common if, if you were a merchant in any way or if you have a business, you buy things for wholesale. And so it's likely that this man was going around and he's looking at different things, different pearls, and then finds this precious one at a great price, and it's, a, it's a, one of great value. And so he goes, sells everything, and comes back and buys this. So the point of these stories is that the, the, the treasure that they found, for us, the kingdom of heaven, salvation, eternity with God, life with God, that treasure was worth absolutely everything. Now, as I go on and I talk about being all in today, I don't want you to get confused because the main point here really is that the kingdom of heaven is not earned. Don't get confused about that. It is not earned. But God expects, Jesus expects us to give everything in return. Now, you might say, well, Dwayne, this is just hyperbole for all you English teachers out there and know that I am bad with English. I went and looked up that word. So hyperbole, maybe this is just a story that Jesus is exaggerating the point. You know, like, man, my homework is killing me. It's not really killing me. Maybe it's that kind of a story. Maybe Jesus is just exaggerating this thing. Well, if we look at the rest of Jesus' teachings, we discover that's not at all the case. Mark chapter 1, verse 17, he calls the disciples. He says, he says come, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And these guys immediately left everything. They left their nets. Can you imagine that? If these guys, that had been, men and women who had been baptized last week, if upon being baptized, I know there's one couple that got baptized in there, if they had said, honey, let's get the kids, we're following Jesus, and just left everything behind. Businesses, houses, everything. That's what the disciples did. That's what Jesus expected. Well, maybe they were just extreme. No, if we look in Mark chapter 19 with the story of the rich young ruler, this guy comes up to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, um, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And this is my paraphrase. So, and Jesus, well, he starts kind of naming the, some different commandments and so forth. And the guy says, hey, I've kept all these since my youth. And Jesus says, one thing you lack Go and sell everything you own and come follow me. And the man went away sad because he had great wealth. He wasn't willing to go all in. And that's what Jesus expected. Now, Jesus elaborates on this in Luke chapter 14. We're going to camp out there, so you might as well turn there. Luke chapter 14, starting at verse 25. says, Now great crowds accompanied him. And he turned and said to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now, again, another controversial verse. This is not, the focus of this is not about, oh, hating somebody else. 
The focus of this is that he expects it to cost us something. The focus is that he's saying, look, when you give your life to Christ, you may walk out this door and there may be a family member who never speaks to you again because you gave your life to Jesus. You may have a friend who renounces you and never speaks to you again because you gave your life to Jesus. Maybe it's an entire group of friends. Following Jesus is not likely to make you popular. It may be a lonely life. It costs to follow Jesus. Taking up your cross will always cost. Always. So he goes on from there, starting at verse 28. It says, For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish it. So, okay, any of you ever owned a business or managed a business? Come on, raise your hand. I see a couple. I know there's more. All right, there we go. whole bunch of you. Now, a wise person, if they're going to start a business, they're going to put together a business plan. And a business plan is no small thing. Business plan, just the one for the cafe here, this is 38 pages, just for a little cafe. And it talks about projections, costs, you know, it talks about staffing, it talks about training, missions, goals, all these different things, all wrapped up into this. The point being, before you go into something, you sit down and you count the costs. You think about what is it going to take and do I have what it takes? And if you don't, you don't do it. For example, we have a, I looked up some famous unfinished buildings here. Marble Hill, Marble Hill Nuclear Power Plant. Anybody heard of this? This thing started in 19, oh, where'd it go? 1977 is when they started building this nuclear power plant, and it was built in Indiana. This power plant, after seven years, had cost the company $2.5 billion. And after seven years, they were only half finished, and the company figured out they didn't have enough money for it, and they walked away and liquidated some of the equipment for a few million dollars. Whoa. A few million, 2.5 billion. Now, that's a bad investment. And quite frankly, if I knew those people, I'd probably make fun of them if it wasn't so sad. Now, another famous building, this one's called Sagrada Familia. This is like the, the brainchild or the, of um, a guy named Antoni Guadi. And this thing was started in 1882 in Barcelona. This guy starts building this thing, this fantastic thing. Well, he died in 1926, and it was only 25% of the way complete. He didn't have the resources or the time to finish this. Now, this thing, it's so odd that somebody would start a building and not finish it, especially at this magnitude, that it draws tourists from all around the world to it. And the tourists bring in millions of dollars, and so they de they've decided they're going to try to finish this thing. And the head architect right now, who is currently on this project, says they hope that it'll be finished sometime in the next century. So keep your calendar open. It's ridiculous to think that somebody would start a building and not finish it. And that's what Jesus is saying. It's ridiculous if we think we're going to give our lives to him a little bit and not all the way. He wants us all the way. He wants us to count the cost and make sure we finish what we start, that we go all in for him. He gives us another illustration back in Luke 14 at verse 31. He says, Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. He's saying, look, you evaluate the battle before going into battle. And if you have no chance of winning, maybe you shouldn't go in. That's what he's saying here. I, I'm curious, how many of you, when you gave your life to Christ, how many of you, did, did somebody tell you, you are going to be in a daily battle that's going to consume your entire life the rest of your life? A spiritual battle that's going to consume you every single day. Were you warned of that? 
when you gave your life to Jesus? I think sometimes we, we get so focused on you know, expanding the kingdom of heaven that people, you know, we want everyone to give their lives to Jesus. We tell them all about this peace that, you know, surpasses all understanding. We tell them about eternity in heaven, but we forget sometimes to tell them about the battle that they're going to engage in. It would be like me saying, hey, let's, you know, rally and you guys say sometime, somehow I had magical words and I could get all of you together and we go out here on, on D Street and we turn around and we're looking this way and we, we're all like Braveheart style, okay? We're about to take on some enemy. We have our axes, we have our hatchets. These days we have our AK-47s. We got everything. We're ready to go to war. We're ready to go to battle and we're standing on D Street and we're looking over at C Street at some enemy coming at us and I get up, and, yeah, freedom. We're yelling, we're screaming, we're so excited. And then all of a sudden I say, all right, we're done. And we go home. The enemy's not gonna stop. They're gonna rout us. You sign up for battle, you show up for battle, you engage, you enlist in the army so that you can fight. And Jesus is saying, when you sign up for me, when you come follow me, I want you all in. I want you to follow me to your death all of the way. To confirm that, if they weren't understanding his illustrations, he then says, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Well, wait a minute. I thought you said that anybody could follow Jesus. Absolutely. Jesus gives freely salvation and he expects us fully in return. He wants all of us. He then goes on to this really, um, I, th this is just kind of a strange little analogy and it's like Jesus gets all squirrely here. You guys ever seen the movie Up? It's like the dogs are going and all of a sudden it's a squirrel and they lose focus on what they're doing. Now, it seems like that's what Jesus is doing in this next section because he's talking about battles and buildings and all of a sudden he starts talking about salt. And in fact, most of our Bibles even separate this into a whole different section as though it wasn't connected, but it is connected. Listen to these words, how, how strange this is, but we'll see if we can understand this. He says in verse 34, salt is good, but if it loses, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is thrown away. He who has ear, let him hear. What? What are you talking about? Well, salt is intended to bring flavor. And he's talking about us. We are intended, when we are all in for Christ, when we are building buildings all the way, when we are going to battle all the way, when we're taking up our cross all the way, that's the flavor that we bring to this earth. He says, when we've lost that flavor, when we're only partly in, we start losing that. So I, me being a visual guy, I, I had to think this through. So I went and I got some salt, some great value salt, by the way. So, I mean, let's think through this parable. We have this salt, salt that's supposed to have flavor. It tastes salty. That makes sense. It should taste salty. Followers of Jesus... Myself, I should be following him all the way. I should bring flavor into this life. So this salt, and he says, if it's lost its flavor. Now, back then, they would oftentimes, they would throw salt in when they were in their ovens to help cook, and it would help heat things up. And when they were done with it, sometimes they would just throw it out on the ground, to, you know, on the soil to waste. Sometimes they'd put it on their, seal, their roofs. I don't know why they'd put it on the roofs. But Jesus is saying, look, if this has no flavor, if it's not doing what it's intended to do, I can't put it in the soil. It's, it's, I, it's, not, it's not good for the soil. And he says, in fact, the manure, this is real manure, by the way, so stay back. He says, the manure, it, you know, I can't even throw it in the manure pile. At least the manure has use. I can use the manure to help the soil and bring nutrients into the soil. But flavorless salt would ruin the manure. And it's like what he's saying is, Dwayne, if I have a big bag of crap, and Dwayne, you're on my crap, and you're only halfway in. Dwayne, if you're not willing to give everything, if you're not willing to build buildings, go to battle and take up your crafts, then Dwayne, you're ruining my crap. Get off my crap. And it's like, whoa, 
Jesus just told me to get off his crap. And he's saying, I don't know what to do with the disciple who's not willing to give his all for me. He says, Dwayne, I'm not willing to, I don't know what to do with you if you're not going to go all in for me. I want all of you, every part of you, every part of your life. So what does this look like? That's the challenge. As I, as I look through my last couple days and I start thinking, well, what did I, you know, what was yesterday like? Was I all in in everything I did? And it's such a subjective thing. Surely Jesus doesn't really expect all of us to sell everything, does he? So I put together a little bit of a test, you know, a litmus test in a sense, for us to think through. How can I evaluate where I'm at, how can I evaluate how in I am with Christ? And two of these three things are external. They can be measured externally. Somebody can tell you, yes, I see this in your life. You can see if it's in your life. And one of these issues is more of an internal thing. It's between you and God, because only God knows your heart. These things are that a life fully devoted to Christ should have the following qualities. The first is proclamation, a life that verbally expresses the gospel. Jesus tells us to go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. We can't make a disciple if we're not actually talking about Jesus. And there's a good chance if we're not verbally talking about what God is doing in our life, then we're not giving him credit and our life isn't fully devoted to him. I'll give some more examples of how to do that in just a moment. The next is demonstration. A life that demonstrates or shows the legitimacy of the gospel by the love and care expressed toward others, as well as a proper stewardship of God's creation. Jesus says, this is how they will know you are my disciples, by your love for one another. So our lives should demonstrate love and care for other people in such a manner that there's no question that we are followers of Jesus and that we're given everything for Jesus. Likewise, the way we take care of our stuff, the way we take care of all that God has entrusted to us Our planet, our resources, our time, our money, all those things. The next is a dedication. This is the one that's internal. It's between you and God. A life that devotes all that one has, all that one is, and all that one thinks to God. All that one has, all that one is, and all that one thinks devoted to God. And this is where we step back and we say, what what have I given for the cross? What have I given for the kingdom of God? You know, for me, one of the the, the first two things when I became a believer that I started working on, one was my language. Don't tell my mom. And she didn't know when I was 14. And the other was actually anger. Language, most of the time, I don't know, you can decide on that. Uh, Language cleaned up pretty quick. And anger, that's still something that can have issues in me. Especially, it depends on how well my child, children are doing in math and whether they're listening when I'm teaching them. It can be a challenge. All these things. But you know what I think is a better question than what have you given up for the cross? What have you yet to give up? If you want to know, are you all in? What are you holding on to that you haven't given him? I told a good friend of mine after we, we spent hours and hours over the last month together, and I finally came to the conclusion the other day out here in the parking lot, and I looked at this good friend, and I said, look, you have two options. As I see it, the way God, the, what I'm hearing from you, what God's saying to you, you have two choices. Either you can give everything you have, sell everything you have literally, and go live in Africa, or you have to quit your job and do something different. Because another good friend of me, mine teaches me or has taught me that we need to redeem what we do. And what he was doing every day at work, he couldn't figure out how to use that for the kingdom. So what, what is work like? How can, how can, rather than selling everything, and maybe God's telling you to sell everything, and if he tells you to sell everything and give everything to a pastor, let me know, give me a call. Um, but, but if he's not telling you that, and he's telling you, hey, I want you to redeem what you do. What does that mean? What does that look like in your life? 
Well, for one of my friends, again, at bike night, he was telling me how he's so blessed that in his job, he's had this young man assigned to him that follows him around at work because they need to go out in pairs for what they do. And he says he spends, he looks forward to the day. He spends every day speaking into this guy's life and demonstrating Jesus to him. Not just preaching at him once in a while, but living it with him day in, day out, 40 hours a week. He's living Jesus for this guy. And that's his intention when he gets up in the day. He could care less about the actual job he does. But he gives everything, cares everything about the relationship that he gets to build while he's there. Or how about your hobbies? Again, going back to bike night. A buddy, you know, I, I was so blessed to see my friends out there. And there was this guy who had come up from Vegas. Okay, these guys just like motorcycles. And there's guys of all ages. There was a guy who'd come up from Vegas and he was bragging to me at dinner about how he'd been kicked out of almost all the casinos and how bad he's in and how the police are after him and all this stuff. And I know that during that night, I know that he heard the gospel three different times. Or at least in some senses. Because I listened as these other men talked about how incredible God was in their life and what God was doing in their life. And he sat there listening to it all. Multiple times. So here's someone who just likes motorcycles and he's using it for the kingdom. What can we redeem for the gospel? What is it that we're still holding on to that we haven't quite given to him? It's going to be a daily struggle, a daily battle, but I would encourage yourself, I would encourage you to, to evaluate yourself and think through those things. Jesus wants us to be all in. He wants us to give everything. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for, for accepting us even, even when we're not all in. But God, I, I pray that you would light a fire under every one of us, that we would devote everything we have to you, every thought that we have be devoted to you, every action we have be devoted to you, because you want followers who are willing to follow you all the way. Jesus, lead us into battle, and thank you so much for saving us. Amen.